Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami. Good evening, everyone. So, uh, in this uh, Dhamma talk, I'd like to briefly touch on some topics which may be useful in your practice, uh, dealing with what we uh, come to see as the right way, the wrong way, and the way which is always appropriate, the way which always works, which is in essence the, the entirety of practice. And a useful uh, way for approaching this is uh, maybe a sutta that struck me um, taken um, just as it appears in the middle of a, a bunch of other suttas about a, a variety of topics. This is in Anguttara uh, Nikaya, so the the chapters on uh, the numbers. And this comes from the chapter of the fours, Sutta 162. And in this sutta, the Buddha um, talks fairly briefly about four kinds of people that he sees in the world. Uh, one who practices with pain and uh, has very slow insight. Another person practices with pain but has very fast insight. A third person um, practices, uh, has a pleasant practice, uh, but they have slow insight. And the final person has a pleasant practice and they have fast insight. The Buddha goes on to explain uh, why you find these four kinds of people, and it basically boils down to the difference between the right way and the wrong way. And this is not something that shows up a lot in the Pali Canon, but when it does, it almost feels like there were, there were veins of teaching that haven't been fully recorded maybe ways that the monks would uh, talk about certain things or the ways they would teach that were not set up in a systematic format that could be easily transmitted from generation to generation. Or maybe ways of teaching that um, made sense to more advanced practitioners, but would just get confusing for um, those who were starting out. And one of these uh, very tiny things that you'll see references to here and there is the difference between the right way and the wrong way. <clears throat> and this deals specifically with why practice might be painful or practice might be pleasant. Uh, so the right way is namely the Eightfold Path, that is right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Well, we've, we've heard this, we've studied this, and we know this. Uh, how is it right? Well, it's, it's right because when we are, uh, the right, the sama, is that which is true or harmonious. And when we are right, then our practice is right. And when our practice is right, then our practice is actually quite pleasant. The Buddha was, was, was known and recorded to teach in a sequential way when he taught to people who were new to Buddhism. And he'd often start by talking about something very, um, very beautiful and acceptable, like the joy of giving. And honestly, this is a major part of Buddhism, because anywhere you go, dana is a huge, huge um, part of community. It's what brings people together and is what we can kind of all agree on, that this is, this is enjoyable, this is pleasant, this is fun. Furthermore, it makes merit. It, it, it brings us together and it builds bonds and it gives us something that we can reflect on in a joyful way. So this is an example of practicing in the right way. Um, to, to, to give with generosity and without um, thinking over much on what result we might get, but to give simply for the joy of giving. Another example would be to practice loving kindness. And the Buddha uh, would sometimes teach the Brahma Viharas, the first of which is loving kindness, to people who 
wouldn't even get the rest of the path. He would, he would say, okay, look, you're, you're focused on making merit and on being happy in this very life. So start here and practice loving kindness and gradually expand it out to include all beings in all realms. And this is an example where the, the Buddha would be teaching somebody to start with practicing with a pure heart. You know, find, start with, with somebody nearby who, who you love dearly and who you only want good things for. And then gradually expand that to, to people you feel more neutral about, people in your immediate environment. And then gradually you can expand that out even to people you don't necessarily like all the time or agree with. And even find it within your heart to wish them benefit um, rather than wishing them harm. Finally, we could um, you know, practice to see things as they really are. And the Buddha teaches things like the perception of impermanence. He taught people to do jhana. And uh, this, was, um, this was the phrase that they used for doing deep meditation. And he would teach this to everybody, not just monastics, but to lay people as well. He'd say, go somewhere peaceful to the root of a tree or to an empty hut or to a cave, or to a mountain grove, you know, just somewhere where you can get away from it all, and sit down, and calm yourself, and focus on the breath. Breathe in, breathe out. Gradually let your stress kind of bleed away. And through being mindful, your mind becomes concentrated. Through becoming concentrated, it comes bright. And you move into the first jhana, where because of your, your attention and your mindfulness, all of the defilements fall away from the mind and you enter a, a mental state that is purely wholesome. Uh, this is synonymous with samasamadhi. It is the right way to practice meditation, right? So this is, this is what we call the right way. If you start from a place where you have no I immediate intrinsic defilements, then your practice will be pleasant. You start with an open mind, you know, open hands and generosity. You start with a pure heart, not wishing ill to anybody. You start with uh, letting go, with relaxation, with uh, paying attention to things in the present moment. Because your mind is not defiled, there is no suffering. Because there is no suffering, you, you, will, you will develop and at the same time, your practice will not be unenjoyable. You know, it will gradually, your mind will get brighter and brighter. And I think all of us uh, are drawn to Buddhism, not just because, you know, it, it's offering us, you know, a way to deal with suffering, which we know very much in our life, but because it's offering us a path where we can be free of suffering. It's not just saying, okay, yeah, this is a noble truth, deal with it but it's saying there is a cessation of suffering and that you don't have to wait until 10, 30, 50, 70 years down the line when you might have a flash of insight and get it, but that you can experience this uh, cessation of suffering and this freedom in this very moment if you know where to look and you attend in the right way. So the right way deals with all of these practices where we find some opening in the, the clouds of delusion and we learn to put one foot firmly on the path, the Noble Eightfold Path. And then when we, 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 we develop that and we figure out the next right way to move forward, we, that's where we go and we do that and we do that. One step leads to the next, leads to the next. And it, is, it can be a long path. But if it's going to be pleasant the entire way, then who can really argue with that? This is what we call the right way. Uh, the second way is what, what is called the wrong way. And it's very hard to tease out the nuance of this and to say that when this was presented, it was not always like you should not do the wrong way, but simply that you should know it is the wrong way. Why is it that we can be practicing in the way that the Buddha taught, and yet our practice can still be painful, unpleasant, difficult, a struggle, a challenge? Uh, the reason for this can be because there are defilements in the mind. There is greed, hatred, and delusion already present. 
Now, I think many of us, as we begin to practice, we find that that is the case. Yes, we, we're stingy in places, you know, we, we like our stuff, we're kind of attached to it. We're, you know, we're, we like some people, but others we just can't stand. And we, we don't want to be told, I should like them. You know, we don't want to be told, you know, just let the mosquitoes bite you. Just have love and kindness for them. We were like, no, I want them to stop. And we feel this very sincerely, very wholeheartedly. Uh, this is our reality, is that we do have some defilements in the mind. And the Buddha says that when one has defilements in the mind, they may practice, but and they may practice wholeheartedly, you know, with all of their 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 effort, and still the practice will be painful. Uh, this is an interesting thing in the suttas because it is said that when one is 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 very wise, in in the in the path, they know the right way and they know the wrong way and they know the appropriate time for each. So there's many times when um, we may find that it, it's useful to still practice, even though the, there are defilements in the mind. And that there are many practices we are given which are not complete teachings in and of themselves. They may, might deal with only a small facet of the path, or more specifically, they may deal with a, a facet of our own minds. And uh, I remember once I gave uh, a teaching, a very full teaching, on the part of the, the Satipatthana that deals with contemplation of the body parts. And for many monastics in the forest tradition of the Theravada, um, this, is, this is hugely important. Like the, it, it, it's taught to novices, to little boys, as soon as they arrive at the monastery. It's considered the most basic a meditation subject that everybody gets <laughs> as part of the ordination ceremony. And yet most lay people, either they don't know it or they've heard it and they, they assume there's something wrong with this teaching because it sounds like the Buddha is, is just talking about anatomy. And I gave this very full teaching about how you can analyze each body part and pull it apart and see how it is impermanent how it is, it is not satisfying, how ultimately it cannot be who you really are. And at the end of this teaching, somebody held up their hand and they're like, well, that's all well and good. And I understand this is in the suttas, but this is not how I was taught to meditate. And I think this is the reality for many of us, is that many of our most tried and true meditation techniques don't really encompass the full Dhamma as the Buddha taught it, but they, they deal with very specific things, yeah? They deal with, with, with maybe doing a mantra or trying to visualize, you know, uh, an object that's very calming for us. Even in terms of uh, vipassana or studying phenomena, we might have practices where, where we're taught to, to add, like, who is the knower? You know, uh, or we might see that uh, a defilement is arising, a, a painful feeling is arising. It might be like, where is this coming from? What is causing this? What is the root of this? And we might do something that the Buddha definitely encouraged called Yoniso Manasikara. We might try to trace it back to its source. But while we're doing this, there's a part of our minds that is also very much aware that this is difficult. This is not an easy process. We are doing this while we are having this painful defilement arise in the mind. And some people even bristle at calling these things defilements at all. Uh, but when you understand the right way and the wrong way, you understand that it's important to call them defilements. The reason we call it the wrong way is not because you should never do it. The reason we call it the wrong way is because it will feel wrong and it will look wrong. And ultimately, you should work to transcend it. The Eightfold Path is the definition of a harmonious and balanced human being. Yeah, but in order to get there, we're going to have to, you know, work through some of the realities of where our mind is at to get it there. And not all of the time do we have the luxury of waiting until we have a wholesome mind state to begin that practice. Sometimes we just got to roll up our sleeves and say, okay, something is, something is arising here. 
but I'm I'm going to I'm going to stay with it. I'm going to I'm going to be mindful and I'm going to pay attention. I'm going to ask where it's coming from and I'm going to see if I can develop any wisdom. And uh believe it or not, the Buddha often taught extremely simple meditation techniques to people. He would sit them down and he'd say, "Okay, well imagine Imagine it like this, you've got a bowl of oil uh, on top of your head, and you've got two men with swords at your back, and they are marching you through a crowd. And if even a single drop of oil comes out of that bowl, uh, they will slice off your head. And you've got to move through this crowd with absolute mindfulness, not, not spilling a single drop. Uh, and this was a meditation subject that he gave some people. And some people were able to attain uh, arhantship, <laughs> full enlightenment with this meditation subject. And I think anybody who has tried this has, 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 <laughs> has realized it didn't produce full enlightenment for them. Um, but this is the reality that this is such a simple meditation subject can produce results. And this is, this is why the wrong way can be effective. There are things that we can do in life that are not, not necessarily wise, that don't necessarily reflect a complete uh, expert understanding of a situation, and yet they still get the job done. Imagine you go up to somebody who is um, painting a wall, and they are painting this wall by picking up the bucket of paint and throwing it against the wall. Now, if you were to ask the question, are they painting the wall? Yeah. Yes, they are getting paint on the wall. It is, it is changing color. But would you say that that is the right way to paint the wall? I mean, no, nobody would say that's the right way to paint the wall. It's not effective, it's, it's not skilled, it's not efficient, uh, it's very wasteful. Um, and just the, just the fact that anybody could do it probably shows that it, there's no thought given to um, how, to, how to really do that uh, effectively. Uh, it can be done with delusion. It can be done with greed. It can be done with hatred. And if you've, <laughs> you've ever seen anybody throw a bucket of paint against anything, <laughs> there may have been some greed, hatred, and delusion present when they did it. Uh, because that's usually the state that accompanies that that kind of um, uh, cruel or thoughtless action, yeah? So uh, practicing with defilement can be like this. Sometimes we, we've got to see that our practice is going to make a mess, but we can still do it if if some important factors are present. Uh, I've I've met many people who are not moving forward in their practice, who are not pushing the boundaries, because whenever they do, they experience difficulty, they experience pain, they experience restlessness, or even sloth and torpor. They find themselves falling asleep on the cushion. Um, they they it becomes unpleasant when they exceed a certain boundary, uh, and there is a point to which our practice will become not fruitful if we push it too far. But um, there, it's not to say we should always avoid uh, pushing ourselves, f feeling unpleasant feelings, if we can be mindful. And so when you're doing your practice, if you find you that you can still be mindful, you can still stay with something, you can still, um, you know, uh, not get up and walk away, but but sit through it. You know, if the experience is unpleasant, but it's not so unpleasant that it completely shuts you down, then this may still be a good place to practice. It might be a really useful place to practice. Because if you're able to see things arising and ceasing, or at the very least, you're able to, to stay with them um, to the point that you might see it cease, or you might see it change in some way that gives you an insight into impermanence or not-self then there is a potential for insight in, in this practice. Whenever we practice and we sit down and suffering is present, delusion is present, and we know, ah, oh, man, this is going to be, this is going to be a difficult sit. We shouldn't expect that just because sitting with it or just because being mindful with it, we are going to suddenly have a breakthrough and it's going to become pleasant. 
if we set up that expectation, we set up an expectation of, if I just do this technique and just keep doing this technique, one day it's going to become pleasant. That might not be a realistic expectation. Uh, but when we understand the wrong way, we understand that what we're doing is through mindfulness, energy, and concentration, we are pushing the boundaries of what we can tolerate. And um, in doing so, we're going to create openings. What is uh, something that triggers us at first, if we learn to be mindful with it, will not trigger, trigger us in the future. And if in the future it doesn't trigger us, it may not bring up the same defilements. So the things that gave us um, difficulty, like just being able to sit for five minutes or being able to focus on the breath or, you know, hearing somebody in the meditation hall breathing heavy and get it, being filled with anger. Later on in the practice, because we've analyzed that and worked with that and studied that and we felt the suffering very internally and we don't want to replicate it or, or keep it going, then... Uh, later on, we find that the same thing doesn't cause any defilements to arise. And we're able to, to just sit and be. And we find ourselves suddenly practicing the right way. Most are like, I'm, I'm here and there's these things that, that used to aggravate me and they don't aggravate me anymore. And so this is actually quite pleasant. Yeah? And this is exactly how the, the, the wrong way could be taught to people. People who, who weren't intellectually capable or just didn't um, even need complex, multifaceted teachings, uh, but just had to be mindful. And many of us are taught meditation techniques with the understanding that if we can just be mindful, if the technique is pleasant enough, acceptable enough, not unpleasant enough, that we can stay with it, it will create these openings where at some point we'll be doing it and it won't even be unpleasant anymore. It won't be difficult anymore. And that this opening that we've created will show us that there are places where suffering ceases. Yeah. And so we can, we can even if there is suffering, we can practice. Uh, the good news is that it, when we understand it in this context, it won't always be unpleasant. And many of us who um, become monastics, we experience this very profoundly at first, the first couple of months, years, <laughs> uh, the first decade even, might be quite a struggle and might have all sorts of ups and downs. But later on, it's like, wow, the things that used to get to me, they don't get to me at all anymore. And we look at the, at the, at the new people coming in and we're like, yeah. It's really not that big a deal. I know it feels like it, but trust me, later on you're going to look back and you're going to laugh because that's what we're doing. We're able to see the same things that cause us suffering and we're able to laugh at them. But this capability is something that's available to anybody. And just to understand that no single technique leads to enlightenment, yeah? You can be taught a meditation technique like just be mindful and know that it's not the just being mindful that is allowing this to work. You still have to be mindful of what is going on. You know, actually keep that mindfulness as though your life depended on it and look at the moments where, you know, our mindfulness drops and say, well, why is that happening? And work that that doesn't happen catch the lapses in mindfulness. And this is how the, the wrong way, even cultivated, leads to skill. Just as somebody who may start out throwing the bucket of paint, if somebody comes along and says, okay, look, you painted the wall technically, but there is a better way to do it. Even if that was all of the instruction they got, that person, that knowledgeable person walked onward and the person was left with just that thought, there is a more skillful way of doing it. They may eventually be able to become a skilled painter of walls just by asking themselves, like, what could this more skillful way be? And looking at the way they're doing things and analyzing the mess that they're making, analyzing, you know, how thoroughly 
they're applying the paint. And through that analysis, arrive at a place where they're actually good and skilled at the task they're attempting. Now we've covered that why practice might be pleasant or practice might be painful. The second part of the sutta deals with why practice might be slow or practice might be fast. And in this, the, the Buddha is showing that whether you're practicing the right way or practicing the wrong way, whatever is appropriate at the time, uh, the, the factors that make it effective practice have nothing to do with whether or not there are defilements in the mind. This is not a practice for perfect people and perfect people alone. You can work with the mind that you have. But what makes the practice effective is what he called the five faculties. These five faculties are also the five powers, namely the faculty of faith, the faculty of energy, the faculty of mindfulness, the faculty of concentration, and the faculty of wisdom. All of these, when they're, they're cultivated to such an extent that they're consistently present, they're, you can call on them whenever you need to, this is when we call them the five powers. Yeah. And these are the difference between slow practice and fast practice. If somebody has weak faith, weak energy, weak mindfulness, weak concentration, weak wisdom, then even if they've got a pure heart, they're very generous, they, uh, they're very good at being in the present moment, then still, even if they're immersed in an environment where they're surrounded by the teachings, their practice might be quite slow um, because they're, they're not applying themselves. Just not suffering <laughs> doesn't lead to enlightenment. Uh, learning about the causes of suffering, you know, completing the the Eightfold Path and the, you know, really harmonizing our, our wisdom, yeah, with seeing reality as it is, uprooting the causes of all future suffering. That requires investigation, and it re requires investigation into those moments when, you know, um, the mind is, is not as bright and pure as it could be, yeah? Even for somebody who's attained jhana, who's attained a mind state that is purely wholesome, there are grades of brightness still remaining to the mind. There are grades uh, where even something that is wholesome is a burden for the mind, is coarse, weighs the mind down, and they, they can start to ask, like, what would it be with, without this? This, this thing that most people would take as something quite joyful, uh, it's still, it's slowing me down, it's weighing me down. What if, what if I were to find a way to, to let it go? Yeah, so there's even room to do that for one who uh, has no defilements currently in the mind. But for one who does have defilements in the mind, if they have faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom, then they will stay with it. Even if it's unpleasant, they will keep investigating. They will keep trying to steady their mindfulness. Uh, and they will, they will have faith in the teachings that they've been given. And in, you know, the Buddha and the Sangha, you know, the people practicing around them, they will, they will stay steady. They will stay the course. And for one who stays the course, who keeps practicing and analyzing, they are like that person who has gotten one brief instruction but uses it to, to cultivate true skill and mastery of their craft. Yeah? So the difference between slow practice and fast practice is, is just that. And it's very interesting that as practice develops, so do these five faculties because these, these five faculties are, are not separate from practice. They are what is being cultivated. They are facets of an enlightened mind. Mm -hmm. So if we start out with them quite weak, then they are something that we can, we can focus on developing. Look at those things that cultivate faith. Look at those things that cultivate wisdom. Um, find the ways that we can apply ourselves to our practice, whether or not it's pleasant. Yeah? Of course, uh, 
it's always uh, probably the, the 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 final thought I'll, I'll offer is um, no matter uh, what which uh, way you find yourself practicing, whether it is it is pleasant and joyful and and easy and there's not many challenges or whether it's difficult and you've been going at it for years and years and the breath is not getting uh, relaxing and you know the, the 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 mind is still chattering whether you're practicing the right way or the wrong way you might just not you, you know, nobody might be able to 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 tell you what you're doing wrong you know, it might not be obvious, yeah? People might keep telling you you are doing it wrong, in fact. This is the, the, the essence of why the wrong way is not talked about in that context quite so much, because the only way to talk about it is that it is the wrong way. And again, saying that it is sometimes the most practical way to go about things doesn't change the fact that it will be unpleasant. And when something is unpleasant, we say that it is the wrong way to do things. Um, but this is the perfect way to see your practice in a balanced way is even if everybody's telling you you're doing it wrong, <laughs> even if it's, if it's, if it's challenging, if it's difficult, um, but you look at yourself and you see that you are learning, that you are growing in faith and energy and mindfulness and concentration and wisdom as you go about it, then even if it's, it's not easy, you know that this is the path that is leading to enlightenment. Uh, and that if your faculties are growing, then you you know that your your insights are going to be coming. They're going to keep coming. Yeah? Because it's the very essence of what they do. They help direct us to the, the next insights that we can be having, no matter what's going on in our practice, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. They help guide us uh, and allow us to move forward, yeah? So with this, uh, I'd like to offer this tonight as uh, a teaching on the right way, the wrong way, and the way that all of us can practice, and uh, may it be of benefit for you in your practice wherever you find yourself.